Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Plain Bagel. I'm your host, Richard Coffin. If videos online are to be believed, the beautiful, free capitalist system that is the stock market, which allows individuals to buy and own shares of companies, has a pretty nefarious secret about it that might shock you. The largest corporations in the US and possibly the world are actually being controlled by two secret puppet masters, BlackRock and Vanguard. And State Street to a smaller extent. You see, if you take any given stock and you look up the top shareholder for that company, you're likely to see one of three names, BlackRock, Vanguard, or State Street. And this isn't just anecdotal because according to a 2017 Cambridge University report, these three companies are actually the top shareholder in 88% of the S&P 500, which might sound impossible, but BlackRock and Vanguard together, the larger of the three, collectively manage $17 trillion in assets, which represents roughly a third of the entire US stock market market capitalization. Now, that money is invested in other assets as well as stocks, so they don't actually own a third of the US stock market, but it just goes to highlight, it's a lot of money. And naturally, this has led a lot of people online to start warning the masses. Uh, one lady sought to spread the message through the medium of dance, warning that these two companies had gobbled up much of corporate America. Vivek Ramaswamy, the presidential candidate, has called this group, quote, arguably the most powerful cartel in human history, but more important than a TikToker or presidential candidate raising the alarm is the fact that it showed up on the Joe Rogan podcast. The guy running BlackRock is really the president of the United States. If we look at the kind of influence he's got in every industry, Joe. Now, large corporations running America, not really shocking news, but what people are particularly concerned about is the fact that Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock specifically, appears to have some sinister intentions behind the place of power he finds himself in, which is that recently he's been using this authority to push ESG, environmental, social, and governance factors that aim to incorporate sustainability into investing. I know, terrifying development, but stay with me, we can get through this. Joking aside though, ESG has become a pretty controversial topic, not necessarily because people are inherently against greener operations or sustainability, but more so about how it's implemented. With some people raising concerns about greenwashing, which is pretending that you have greener operations than you actually do, and what standards are actually used to rate a company based on its ESG variables, since there's no uniform standard here, and ESG to one company can be defined differently than ESG at another. But BlackRock has more or less taken up the mantle in the space and the CEO Larry Fink has pretty openly discussed his intent to explicitly pressure companies to report and adopt different ESG initiatives. If you don't achieve these levels of impact, it, your compensation could be impacted, okay? You have to force behaviors. And regardless of whether you support ESG or not, you could see why a lot of people find this shocking that a single corporation would have this much influence and why it's caused a lot of people to really rally against these companies. But some believe in BlackRock explicitly uses its size and influence over ESG to manage competition, pull the strings of politicians, and ultimately control everything from the news that we consume to the food that we eat. And with Larry Fink being involved with a number of international institutions such as the World Economic Forum and BlackRock having been tapped by the government during past crises, you can see how easy it is to form world domination theories around these groups. But I want to talk about these companies today and, and the relationships they have with publicly traded stocks, not really to defend them or even defend their size, but rather to highlight that most of the claims you see circulating online about BlackRock and Vanguard and their unfettered influence over the stock market are at best exaggerated and at worst complete misunderstandings of how these companies function and even how share ownership works. That's not to say they don't have influence. A lot of people highlight how ExxonMobil saw three new ESG focused directors elected to their board in part thanks to BlackRock support. But in this video, I'll try to lay out all the details and the nuance of the situation so you understand the power that they have but also the power that they don't have that a lot of people claim they do. And you might know that I recently put out a short on this exact topic, but it really wasn't up to par with the nuance that I try to strike with my videos. So I'll be taking my time on this one to provide a more uh, neutral, hopefully, perspective on things. Let's start with the easiest claim to tackle here, which is that BlackRock and Vanguard basically own everything. Obviously, as the largest shareholder in all these companies, that might lead you to believe that somehow these companies have managed to gobble up a colossal chunk of the stock market for their own benefit. And this is indeed a popular claim that circulates on social media, largely by people who are outside the finance industry. But the belief that these two institutions own everything really just stems from a misunderstanding of what these companies are. Uh, because at $17 trillion in assets under management, 
isn't their money. These companies are asset managers, meaning they take client money and help invest it, taking care of all the research and administration that comes with that. BlackRock, for example, manages $10 trillion in what's called assets under management, uh, the assets they manage, but they themselves only own, in BlackRock's case, $123 billion in total assets, which is the amount you'll find on their financial statements. The $10 trillion is actually client money from the millions of investors, including other companies, pensions, YOLOers on the Robinhood app, who have put their funds into one of BlackRock's mutual or exchange traded funds or other solutions. But while that money is invested through a BlackRock fund, it is not BlackRock's money. They just facilitate the investment and indeed do hold the shares in custody, which is why they show up as a top shareholder but they aren't the ultimate owners of those shares. You could compare it to how a bank takes deposits from clients, but even there, banks actually do treat client deposits as money of their own. And so long as they keep certain metrics in check, they can treat it as their own funds for funding operations and making loans. Whereas these asset managers actually face stricter requirements in terms of what this money can and cannot be used for, with the investors, again, ultimately being the owners. So right away, hopefully that addresses the more uninformed claims about the situation. These companies haven't managed to gobble up a bunch of the world's assets. The shares effectively belong to their millions of clients. But to be fair, that's not what everyone who's critical of these companies is claiming. Uh, people like Patrick Beth David aren't claiming that these companies own everything but rather that they control them. As asset managers, Vanguard and BlackRock determine how client money is invested, and you might expect that gives them a lot of power. For example, Larry Fink has talked about having private meetings with directors for companies, and a lot of people assume that in walking into a boardroom, he will tell directors what he wants them to do, and if they refuse, he can threaten to offload their position, which in many cases would be a massive hit to the company's stock. But the idea that these companies can threaten institutions with the offloading of their giant positions to get what they want, is again really unfounded for one key reason, which is that the majority of money managed by BlackRock and Vanguard is indexed, meaning they don't really control where it gets invested. Of BlackRock's $9.4 trillion in assets under management, 6.2 trillion or 66%, is passively managed via index funds and ETFs, with the vast majority of equity AUM being indexed. Meanwhile, of Vanguard's $7.2 trillion, 79.1% is indexed. What this means is that the vast majority of this money is simply copying an index. So BlackRock can't really, on a discretionary basis, sell and buy stocks. Uh, if Larry Fink doesn't like what Apple is doing, too bad. Their biggest fund is the S&P 500 fund, and Apple is the largest constituent of that index at around 7%. So they have to hold a sizable Apple position. That fund is legally obligated to stick to its mandate and maintain an investment in the index. Now you might say, but Richard, if these asset managers control the index, then they still get that leverage. Sure, uh, but the vast majority of their funds track external indices that they don't have any control over. So you can see that for the vast majority of this money, there's really no threat of them offloading the shares because again, they don't really control where the money gets invested. In fact, indexing is really the only reason these companies have gotten so big in the first place. People have bought BlackRock and Vanguard funds because they passively track external broad-based indices. John Vogel, the guy who created Vanguard, more or less invented the index fund, uh, which has been a huge benefit to investors, uh, providing market exposure with very minimal fees. So yes, BlackRock and Vanguard could threaten companies with their active footprint, uh, but again, at least on the equity side, that's a very small share of their overall AUM. It doesn't put them in a position to really hold that above uh, the director's heads. That being said, even with BlackRock and Vanguard not technically owning these shares, even with them not technically being able to determine where a lot of this money gets invested, they do still have a lot of influence. And this is really the part that I want to expand on given that I wasn't able to do so with the short. And that all comes down to the voting rights of these shares. As you probably know by now, shareholders are the effective owners of a company. Uh, but because publicly traded stocks can have millions of individual investors, the way that the shareholders control the company and what it should do is typically by voting on key corporate events. Uh, things like whether a company should accept a merger or acquisition, uh, and even things like management compensation. Shareholders also vote to elect the board of directors, which is a body that looks to keep management under check and represent shareholders at the corporate governance level. However, when you invest into a fund, your voting rights are typically forfeited to the fund manager. So even though those assets under management isn't their money, they do get to vote with the rights of those shares as if it were. And as mentioned, this does give 
the company's influence. Uh, again, with ExxonMobil, we saw three directors from an activist hedge fund, Engine Number no. 1, elected in 2021, thanks largely to BlackRock support, which was able to swing the vote. And with Larry Fink being very open to company CEOs in his letters, uh, demanding that they increase climate reporting and consider other stakeholders with their operations, you could see how this raises concerns for an abuse of power. Having this level of centralization can be a problem. And you might think, Richard, Checkmate. Here's our irrefutable proof that these companies do in fact control the world, uh, that Larry Fink is in fact going to boardrooms, telling them what to do, and they're going to listen to whatever he wants. Well, no. Again, really not trying to downplay the real issues that could exist here, uh, but there are again some very key caveats that no one really covers when describing these institutions as being these sort of puppet masters behind the scenes. The biggest one being that it's still a minority vote. Even if these companies wanted to have complete control over what these shares and what these companies did, they simply don't have that level of power. Uh, with ExxonMobil, for example, BlackRock only owned 6.7% of the share float. And the only reason those directors, which at the end of the day only made up three of the 12 seats on the board of directors, the only reason they got elected is because they also had other shareholder support, which makes sense because over a 10 year period, the stock actually had a negative price return of 30%. So it's not shocking that investors brought in external directors in hopes of shaking things up. And for most of these positions, the companies have less than a 10% stake, especially when it comes to the larger companies, which is still influential, but does leave another 90 plus percent of voting rights out there for other investors. Not to mention that while these asset managers might be active on the voting side, they really don't want to be activist investors where you go and try to say revolutionize how a company is run. Uh, it's quite a labor intensive operation and really for their size and business model, it wouldn't really be all that feasible. And perhaps the easiest demonstration of the power that these companies don't have in terms of being master puppeteers is the number of times that they didn't get what they want, that they voted against something and still saw the resolution go through. That's of course not to say that their vote doesn't matter, but to be a stickler, it's a very different picture than what a lot of people describe in terms of BlackRock really pulling the strings. It's one thing to say these companies have influence, which is something I would agree with. It's another to say that they're so ingrained in operations and controlling what management does that they have this mastermind level control over 88% of the S&P 500. Secondly, on top of these companies already having a minority vote, uh, the companies have actually recently started passing along their votes to their underlying fund holders. BlackRock last year announced what it calls its voting choice program, where nearly half of the company's indexed equity voting rights will be available for pass through votes to its unit holders, with Vanguard similarly piloting a program called proxy voting choice. And to be fair, this probably is in response to the policymakers who have been challenging them about the authority they have, but it nonetheless takes what might be say an 8% equity stake and really shrinks their voting control further. And finally, while it's very clear how a problem could arise from, again, this centralization of power, uh, these companies are ultimately still answerable to their investors. A lot of people worry about BlackRock pursuing a woke agenda and pushing ESG variables uh, at the expense of their investors' return, but these companies still have a fiduciary duty to their clients, uh, meaning there is a legal responsibility to act in the interest of their underlying shareholders. This is doubly so for Vanguard, who itself is actually owned by its fund holders. In other words, if, if you bought part of a Vanguard fund, congratulations, you're one of the puppeteers. Now, some have argued that the pursuit of ESG does violate this fiduciary duty since it's considering something outside of financial returns, but ESG variables are often being considered from a risk standpoint, with the idea being that companies with, say, high pollution will eventually face pressures from either high regulatory costs or social backlash if they don't improve their operations. If you're arguing that it's a risk to not consider these variables, it's really hard to demonstrate a violation here. And if the underlying investors who those rights to vote belong to don't like how BlackRock is managing with their money and that voting power, they can in many circumstances obviously switch to another asset manager. Yes, there are instances where investors are using 401ks and pension plans, which might be administered by these institutions, in which case the uh, participants don't really get a choice in who to switch between. But plan administrators do have that choice if they believe fiduciary duty is being violated here. And all this is on top of the fact that according to a lot of papers and surveys on the topic, a lot of people want ESG considerations. According to a 2022 study by asset management firm Capital Group, 89% of institutional and wholesale investors consider ESG issues in some form as part of their investment approach, and a survey by GlobalScan found 82% of investors say they are interested in investing in companies that are socially and environmentally responsible, while 78% consider or actually invest with ESG in mind. 
figures that have actually increased over time. And while people are concerned about the potential abuse of power of BlackRock, uh, say voting out directors who uh, don't conform to their strict ESG agenda, that's not really what we've seen play out. BlackRock and Vanguard's support for ESG initiatives has actually plummeted recently. In 2021, it supported nearly half of global shareholder ESG initiatives, but last year that percentage dropped to 22% and has now fallen to 7% in the last 12 months. With BlackRock saying that a lot of these proposals were overreaching, lacking economic merit, or simply redundant. And it feels really weird to argue, don't worry guys, these asset managers do only care about returns. Uh, they don't care about other stakeholders as you feared. But it's pretty clear that the priority for these companies is going to be the return of their investments, even if they do consider some ESG variables. Because at the end of the day, if they don't earn a reasonable return for their investors, they're going to lose them. And I'd be willing to speculate that a lot of Larry Fink's statements are more about ESG pandering than they are an ultimate unveiling of his secret agenda. Uh, because if you read any statement from a CEO or executive, even from oil and gas companies, they kind of sound the same, talking about social and environmental responsibility. It's really just a marketing tactic. Anyway, hopefully that helps to paint a full picture. Again, it's not to say that that five to 10% vote on a given large publicly traded stock does not have an impact and that it doesn't matter. And I actually think there could be arguments again for breaking these companies up. I generally favor competition and I think we could see more problems if these companies continue to grow larger and larger. But we're really not at the point where BlackRock or Vanguard have the executives of Apple or whatever company in their back pocket when there's another 80 to 90% of shareholders who obviously have their own interests in mind. There are other concerns around BlackRock's ESG ratings and how they can be used to influence other asset managers, including through their Aladdin platform and the risk of collusion between these asset managers, which would obviously pose a problem, but it's hard to address these without any real evidence. Substantial claims require substantial evidence. And while I wouldn't put it past a large financial institution to abuse its position of power, the most evidence we have here are some marketing pieces by Larry Fink and BlackRock helping to elect some ESG focused directors that were nominated by an external hedge fund. Anyway, that's a video. Hopefully things were laid out better than with the short I put out. If you like this video, please do make sure to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. It does help the channel tremendously and let me know your thoughts. Uh, down below. Like I said, in my own view, there might be a need for regulation here, but things are really misrepresented in terms of the degree of power these companies have. But I'd be happy to hear your thoughts, even if you disagree. Thanks again for joining. Be safe out there.